Hello. Hello again. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Bill Podlaski. So he did his PhD with Tim Vogels and is now doing a postdoc with Christian Machens in Lisbon, both big names in computational neuroscience, and he's interested in neural data analysis and spike-based computations. Uh, Bill, we are looking forward to your talk. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me the chance to speak about my work today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about this work, it's joint work with Christian Mackens, on using excitatory inhibitory spiking networks for universal function approximation. So uh, so we've already seen a bunch of, of uh, approaches towards spike-based computation in this conference. And I guess generally they can fall into one of two categories. So we have rate coding um, where uh, we're using the average number of, of spikes that a spiking neuron will fire in a given time as an input-output function. Um, and that can be used for things like converting a deep net to a spiking net. And then we have this sort of umbrella term, temporal coding, which would correspond to wherever we have kind of uh, time-varying spike patterns. Uh, things like spike latency will fit into that or anything with precise spike time. So in this talk, I'm going to be talking about a, a different approach, spike coding, which I think kind of falls somewhere in between these two. Um, we've already seen some examples in the conference of this. There was the, this talk by Michele Narden yesterday on uh, doing nonlinear dynamical systems. And then there's this work from Guillermo Martin Sanchez on applying this to the hippocampus. So uh, just to contextualize this work, I think Spike coding networks, uh, so they, this was started by Sophie Deneuve and later continued by Christian Mockins and many other people. And there's often this criticism that they, they only work with toy models, um, such as you know, doing autoencoding, encoding a signal X and reading it out again. And then uh, they have been applied to some more general problems, more universal computations, but uh, such as this work in Thalmeyer et al. But when that, when that, when that happens, you kind of lose the what, what I think is one of the benefits of spike coding, which is the, their interpretability. So here in this talk, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be talking about how we can do universal function approximation with just vanilla spiking neurons, and we get all of the interpretability and geometric intuitions that we would get from uh, the normal spike coding networks. OK, so I'm going to start with a, a generic integrated fire network. Uh, this network is receiving a signal C in, which could be spikes, but here it's a continuous signal. Here are some spike trains of the network, which I'm modeling as direct deltas. And then we have the typical voltage equation of the integrating fire neuron, which is integrating its inputs and then receiving also feedback spikes. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I, it's convenient to think about this integrating fire neuron in a different form, um, which is the integral form. So this is similar to the spike response model of Wolfram Gerstner, if you're familiar with it. But it's essentially just uh, considering that uh, the membrane of the neuron is essentially doing a low-pass filtering. So we can have this, this kernel H, and we, we can then transform the inputs C in into a new uh, variable X, which is a low-pass filtered version of that, and then the spikes uh, into R, which are low-pass filtered spikes. So if we do that, we can then rewrite the voltage equation in this form, where the voltage at any given time is just going to be a weighted combination of this input X and then the feedback of the filtered spikes. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce an important uh, assumption into our model, which is that we're going to consider low rank connectivity. Uh, for simplicity, for the sake of this talk, it's going to be rank one. Um, so this is something that's, that's quite common in, in network models. In the spiking domain, for example, the neural engineering framework from uh, Elias Smith uses this, and also more recently in rate networks. This work from Master Giuseppe Anasogic also uses it. Um, and also, for those of you familiar with, with previous work on spike coding networks, the autoencoder also uses this, but it's a very particular constraint of this uh, low rank connectivity where we have a decoding matrix. And that decoding matrix basically specifies the recurrent weights, the feed forward weights, and everything. So here we're going to generalize that. And we're going to consider that the recurrent weights are, are the product of two different matrices or vectors, depending on the rank, um, E and D, which basically stand for an encoder and a decoder. And these are going to be distinct from the feed forward weights. So it turns out this generalization is, is uh, it has very, very interesting uh, implications for computation. So now I'm just going to plug this assumption into our voltage equation. So we can replace the W with ED, 
and we see that we have now a sum of inputs that this neuron is receiving from other neurons, and it only depends on D. So I'm going to define a latent variable here called Y, which is going to be exactly equal to this sum. So Y is basically a linear readout of the network. It's going to be the linear combination of filtered spikes. And then I'm going to plug that into our voltage equation. So now we have this very simple form of the voltage uh, of each neuron in the network, which is basically a weighted sum of feedforward inputs and this latent variable feedback. So this, this readout, we can imagine that this is, the, this is the variable of interest that we want to read out from the network. Um, it's going to fluctuate as, uh, with, with spikes in the network, and then it's going to decay to zero when there's no spikes. Um, so overall, basically what I've told you so far is, so I've started with a generic integrated fire network. I've then added this rank one assumption to the recurrent connectivity, and I arrive at this, this uh, network that does a one-dimensional transformation of x to y. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to basically show you what we can get from this sort of transformation. So what, what kind of function approximation capabilities do we get? So again, we have this transformation x to y. I'm going to remind you that y is a linear readout of filtered spikes. And now I'm going to add a constraint that the elements of, of this connectivity, e and d, are all going to be positive. And then we're going to play around with excitation and inhibition as just uh, a sign, an overall sign on this feedback. So we have inhibition uh, where each neuron is receiving negative feedback and excitation where each neuron is receiving positive feedback from the latent variable. So let's start with inhibition. Um, so here we have our input-output space. Um, and this simplified form of the voltage basically allows us to visualize each neuron's voltage in this space. Um, so we can visualize the areas of the space where the neuron is above threshold and will spike, and areas where it's below threshold. So here I'm plotting one neuron's threshold, which is basically, this is the point where the voltage is equal to the threshold. And this delineates two, two areas of the space. So we have a, a super threshold space where the neuron will fire a spike, and then the sub-threshold space. Um, and we can see that uh, as the latent variable increases, the neuron is receiving more negative feedback. So it's going to be more sub-threshold, it's going to be hyperpolarized. Here I'm adding a second neuron, which has different parameters, so it has a different boundary. And this will further delineate this area of the super threshold space. So this is where at least one, one neuron is above threshold. And then the subthreshold is where all the neurons are below threshold. So we can quickly go through an example of the dynamics of, of this network. Um, so imagine that, we, that our input is 0. And here is the latent readout. So it's in the subthreshold area, which means that there's no spikes. So this latent variable will decay. And it will keep decaying until we get to one of these boundaries. So this is essentially that one of these neurons is, is being driven, its voltage is being driven to threshold. And it will fire a spike here. And then the latent variable will increment upwards. And we can see here that uh, the interpretation of this as an inhibitory network. So this neuron, uh, when, it, when it spikes, it's driving the readout away from its own threshold. So it's inhibiting itself, which is effectively the, the neural reset. And then it's also driving the readout away from the other neuron's boundary. So it's also inhibiting the other neuron. So we have an, uh, an all inhibitory network. So depending, uh, regardless of what the input is, we essentially have this type of dynamics. So we end up getting this, uh, this kind of uh, V-shaped input output function, which is convex. Um, and it turns out that this generalizes. So we can basically define any arbitrary convex function, y equals f convex of x. And we can approximate that through a bunch of neural boundaries. And we end up getting this convex attracting input output function. Um, so this type of all inhibitory network was previously explored in the lab by uh, Alan Menku and Sander Kimink. This was published in NeurIPS in 2020. Um, and so in this, in this uh, talk, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to consider now what happens when we add excitation. So let's go to the excitatory network. So here, again, we can add a couple of neural boundaries in this space. Um, but because the feedback is now positive, this kind of inverts the area of the space where we have super threshold and sub threshold um, voltages. So now as the latent variable increases, the neurons are, are receiving more positive feedback. So they'll be uh, in their more likely to be in the super threshold area. So if we again consider a particular example, we have x equals 0 here. Um, when the readout is in the sub threshold area, it's simply going to decay to 0. Now it's decaying away from the neural boundaries. Um, but if it starts excuse me, if it starts above one of the neurons thresholds, it's going to fire a spike. And unlike the inhibitory network, 
it's now going to drive the readout further in it, into its own super threshold area. So it effectively doesn't have a reset anymore, and it's basically going to continue to fire uncontrollably. It's also going to drive the readout into the other neuron's boundary, and it's basically going to excite the other neuron to fire spikes as well. Um, so essentially, what we have now is this unstable boundary, where either the readout is going to decay to zero or it's going to explode. Um, and it turns out this also generalizes to any arbitrary concave function, in this case, for excitation. So we can define a concave function, and we can delineate a piecewise approximation to that, piecewise linear approximation with excitatory neurons. OK, so it looks like excitation on its own is not very useful because it produces an unstable boundary, um, which is something that we sort of already knew from a lot of research in neuroscience. But we know that we can couple excitation and inhibition to do something useful. So that's the next step. Um, so now I'm going to couple these two populations. Um, so both populations are doing this transformation of x to y. Um, and to couple them, I'm going to give each population its own independent readout. So we have yi for inhibition and ye for excitation. And now when I couple them together, I get uh, basically a 3D space. So now these neural boundaries are surfaces in 3D. And they, the properties of convex and concave uh, functions still apply. So now the inhibitory boundary is now convex as a function of x and the recurrent input from ye. And I'm kind of representing this as a smooth boundary, but you can imagine that this is being approximated in a piecewise linear way by a bunch of neurons. Um, and similarly, the excitatory boundary is now concave as a function of x and the recurrent input from inhibition. So ideally, we want to visualize these, these two boundaries in the same space, uh, but it's a bit difficult. So for the moment, I'm going to remove x. We're going to assume that x is fixed. And I'm just going to consider a slice through these two boundaries. So now we can visualize yi as a function of ye for fixed x, and ye as a function of yi for fixed x. And now we get curves very similar to what we had before. So inhibition is this convex function, and excitation is this concave function. And now if I flip the, ex the excitatory boundary, I can then put it in the same space as inhibition. And the resulting uh, plot is this one. So now we have the excitatory boundary in red, the inhibitory boundary in blue. Um, we have areas of the space where both populations have neurons above threshold. We have areas where all the neurons are below threshold. And then we have some mixtures in between. So it turns out that this crossing point of the two boundaries ends up being a stable fixed point of the system. And what's more is that it, it yields neurons that are balanced and have AI activity. So we end up getting activity that's pretty similar to, to a cortical uh, excitatory inhibitory activity. Furthermore, uh, I guess some of you might might look at this picture and think about uh, rate dynamics, so like Wilson-Cohen like null clines, um, and it turns out that we also have a connection to those types of networks. So, uh, so then maybe some of you are, are wondering at this point, okay, what did we gain from this? Basically, I've, I've started from a spiking network, and it seems like now I've just re-derived uh, rate equations. But I'll remind you that um, we actually, in this case, we have full control over these boundaries. So they're not really null clients, but we can arrange the neurons in uh, whatever way we would like, uh, provided that they still have these convex and concave constraints, to make this boundary crossing wherever we want. And once we add x back, we see that actually these dynamics are part of a continuum. So as we change x, we end up having a different, we can potentially have a different crossing of these boundaries, and we can get a particular input-output function as a function of x. So really what we're interested in is how, does the, how do these E and I boundaries change uh, their crossing as a function of x? This yields the input-output function of the network. And I don't really have time to get into it here, but essentially this type of formalism can, can be uh, used for universal function approximation. So in a nutshell, it's essentially that uh, the, the readouts end up being compositions of convex and concave functions. Um, and there's a lot of work in, math, in mathematics to, to show that such compositions um, yield uh, universal approximations to functions. OK, so in the last minute of the talk, I'll show you a very simple toy example of this. So we have this desired function, which is this saw-like function, um, which is quite complicated. It's non-convex. Um, and we want to approximate this with a spiking network. So what we can do is just arrange some neurons in this space so that their boundary crossings will approximate this. So we actually only need three excitatory and three inhibitory neurons to do this. And we see that each of these, each of these colored uh, planes corresponds to one neuron. And they're arranged such that as a function of x, 
the boundary crossings will delineate this function. So we can simulate this in a spiking network. And here I'm providing the input x varying from 0 to 10 over time. We see we have three excitatory, three inhibitory neurons that are firing spikes. And the latent readouts, so we have the excitatory readout in red, the inhibitory readout in blue. And from the simulation, the spikes are yielding the excitatory readout to follow this, this particular function. Um, OK, so you'll have to take my word that this also uh, uh, can be expanded to higher dimensions. And it turns out that it's quite a, it's quite a powerful approach because it actually maps onto a particular optimization problem, a minimax optimization problem. And this has a lot of connections to different things in the field. Uh, I think I'm running a bit out of time, so uh, I will skip over that. But, uh, yes, it would be better but to essentially, um, we think that this, this is a promising approach for, for scaled up computation. So with that, I'll summarize. Um, what I've shown you here today is that low rank spiking networks can be seen to represent latent variables. Um, and they form different types of boundaries, depending on if they're excitatory or inhibitory. When we couple excitatory and inhibitory boundaries together, we get stable dynamics, and we get uh, systems that can do universal function approximation. So in future work, we're hoping to scale this up. Um, and we should have a preprint out about this work very soon. I would just like to finish by thanking a couple former members of the Mockins Lab, uh, Sandra Kimink and Alan Menku, whose work was very inspirational for this, as well as the rest of the Mockins Lab and our funding sources. And I'll finish there. Thanks. OK, thank you very much, uh, Bill. So we have a couple of questions. <clears throat> Okay, one is by, uh, as four votes by Dean Rance. Uh, I might have missed it, but is this, uh, is the fixed point uh, globally stable or do uh, YE and uh, YI need to be carefully initialized? So uh, it basically depends on the, the overall shapes of these boundaries. So here you'll notice that in this picture, I, I kind of, at some point, this excitatory boundary becomes a dotted line, which is basically that we wouldn't want this excitatory boundary to continue and, and end up surpassing the inhibitory one. So as long as the inhibitory boundary here keeps, uh, keeps kind of winning out over excitation, it will be globally stable. So there are, essentially there are uh, constraints so that it will be I see. Okay, then we have another question by uh, Worldwide Neuro. <laughs> Uh, probably done. This is really neat. What's, what is still required to scale this approach to larger problems? Uh, okay, thanks so much for that question because it gives me the opportunity to briefly mention uh, some stuff that I, that I glossed over here. So, so one approach is, is basically converting deep nets to spiking nets. And essentially there we could, we could basically use these neural boundaries. So we would, would basically train a deep net and then use these neural boundaries as function approximators and fit that function. But I think a more promising approach is this mapping to an optimization problem. So there's a lot of work in, in deep learning that, that is looking at using deep implicit layers, which are basically replacing a, a deep net layer with an implicit function, which could be an optimization function or an equilibrium function. And you can train directly on that. So the idea would be we could actually train on this optimization problem, and then we would have a direct mapping to a spiking network. So I think that's the most promising approach for scaling this up. OK. Well, uh, thank you very much, Bill. We have more questions, but I think it's time to go to the other, uh, to the other talk. So thank you again for your interesting talk.